So this is Ben, and this is Gabriel. Uh, yes, another round of applause. Let's hear it. So I would love to make this uh, interactive conversation. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about for this film. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe we could start off, uh, Ben and Gabriel, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, what's developed since the film has been concluded and, you know, just to, just to catch us up to today. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Julian's situation uh, you know, is, is essentially the same. He's in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison, uh, fighting his extradition to the US. Uh, there was a high court, uh, the high court ruled in favour of the US and, and Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, signed off on his extradition um, and said that he could be extradited, and that was in June 17. And uh, now he has lodged a final appeal, his final chance in the High Court or in the UK courts, and uh, we're waiting on a decision from the High Court whether they'll uh, accept that appeal application or not. Um, but, uh, you know, this legal proceeding, like Stella says in the film, is this, and Nils Melzer as well, it's this sort of never-ending legal proceeding, and the whole time Julian is in this, what Nils Melzer calls this sort of... Uh, you know, he's suffering psychological torture, essentially. And, and his situation hasn't changed uh, since Meltzer and, and the experts that he took to the prison found that he was suffering the effects of psychological torture. So I was talking to uh, an environmental lawyer, Stephen Donziger, yesterday, and he, he phrased it in a very interesting way. He said, you know, the judicial system is sort of being used as a laundromat, you know, to, to, to clean up this per persecution. Uh, and and give and wash it so it's sort of acceptable uh, to the public, um, and uh, that's the way I sort of see the legal proceeding proceeding now. It's, it's to keep Julian there, to keep him in this torturous uh, situation. Sure. Okay. Um, questions? If you have questions, please raise your hands. Um, we can start what is right. The due date on the appeal? Please. I'm sorry. Could you repeat? When do we expect the appeal to? Uh... Well, it's just it's up to the high court judges now. So um, they've got the US uh, DOJ did a reply, and that was due on the thirty first. And um, now it's up to the judges on, on when they want to hand down their decision of whether they, you know, what what appeal points they will hear, or whether they will uh, reject the appeal entirely. Uh, so, but yeah, expect that to happen before the end of the year. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so. sir. And since uh, Julian has, throughout this period that he's been incarcerated, he really has not been able to do his work. And as the opening quote in the film uh, makes clear, by example, when you torture people, uh, you affect others. And so uh, your verdict, you know, probably other journalists are not doing their job. Uh, and. So during that same period, what is the important work that the journalists of the world have not been doing about the things that are most important and most kept where the deepest secrets are that need to be exposed? What kind of different world would we perhaps be having if our journalists and Julian had been able to do their work in all these years that he's been incarcerated? Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind picking up on that. It's it's a, it's a fantastic point. I know travelling around with the film, and, and obviously we started making in 2020, so it's been a, a two-year process. But that's so true. Journalists around the world, particularly national security journalists, um, look at Julian's experience, and um, I think there's been a real pullback on, on the clarity of reporting. There's a real concern around their own prosecution. You know, that's in Western countries, but the fact that the US are doing it China, Russia, other countries look at that and they think, well, that gives me a cut lunch to do that as well. So it doesn't matter where you are a journalist, the fact that Julian's held there and the longer he's held there, he's held there as an example. Anyone who wants to report, particularly on national security, um, they're thinking twice. You know, how they do it um, is uh, a different matter. You know, you, you look at, you know, we've just seen the end of the Afghan war. It's 20 years, you know. Uh, what Julian published, WikiLeaks published, what a whole bunch of their partner organisations published. 
um, we were able to see on, on what happened in that, the Guantanamo Bay uh, files, the prisoners, and also the Iraq War uh, reports as well. Um, you know, maybe if uh, we will continue to see what else is happening around the world with Julian's persecution, persecution. Would, would you apply it to everything that's happened with COVID, which you know is absolutely extraordinary the way we've shut down the world and transferred wealth to the uh, the wealthiest and um, uh, implemented all sorts of strange procedures and everything with huge secrecy, including apparently. Uh, uh, the virus having been created by the military and released. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just want to say one thing on that. Everyone's weaponizing information. All the political parties are doing it. All the corporations are doing it. And we're all the ones that are suffering. And I think organisations like WikiLeaks uh, and their charter, what their manifesto set out to do was really bring truthful information that was backed up in a kind of scientific manner and, and publish original documents. So I think the need for journalists, you know, publishing that sort of truthful information is in such dire need today. Um, and what what governments around the world are able to do on either side of politics and what corporations are able to do now uh, is really murking the waters and it's really hard to see a bit of clarity in all of it. So I think that, you know, with what WikiLeaks, we, you know, they're dearly needed. Any other organisation like that is really dearly needed at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh -huh. I kind of have a question. I just want to make one statement because there was one part of the movie that was, it just struck me in, in a way, and it's when your father um, said that what he wanted to do was to give love, and it seemed that it was something that was very difficult for him to figure out. And it dawned on me that that's what Julian is trying to do for all of us, is give us such a significant I mean, love. I never looked at it that way. I thought it was truth. And I don't know if that's what you were going for, but that's how it struck me. Yeah, I mean, we both Julian Case and John's, you know, they're neurodiverse. They have a particular way of looking at the world yes. and trying to understand it. And I think the interaction with other humans is, you know, particularly challenging, uh, you know, particularly being on the autism spectrum. And that was what John was trying to explain, but, I, you know, I think there's, a, there's an element to that. Uh, their relationship to the world is, is, is you know, another perspective, another particular perspective as well. I also want to say something else, and I do want to ask you a question, because I think the situation is so incredibly desperate, and I feel a lot, and I'm, perhaps you all do, but really, do you think there's any alternative then for people to start to be willing to be arrested for this cause? And do you have any other ideas that actually individuals could do to try at this time to save Julian? Yeah, well, you know, uh, as we've traveled, you know, all over the world over the last three years, and uh, as we go from place to place, we see, uh, we see this worldwide movement, you know, building, and we can see, uh, you know, there's now parliaments Every European Parliament now has a uh, Julian Assange group in it, a group of parliamentarians who are calling for Julian's freedom because of what it means to their people, and and they're reporting on on these sorts of issues. Even we have world leaders now, so you know uh, the Australian Prime Minister has said enough's enough, and he doesn't see what purposes served of Julian being in prison. You've got uh, the Mexican Prime Minister who's uh, made a statement. You've got the Vice President of Argentina who's calling for Julian's freedom. You've got the uh, new President of Colombia, Petro, calling for Julian's freedom. Uh, Boric in Chile uh, calling for Julian's freedom. So there are world leaders all around the world who are, who are, who are calling for his freedom and there's this sort of wave, uh, this growing wave of, of people. Um, because these leaders and these politicians they just represent us, like we elect them, uh, but they represent millions and millions of people. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Berlin and on, the, on, the, on the steps of the Reichstag, we had 40, 41 uh, parliamentarians there, all you know, holding up sides for Julian Assange, and that's millions of Germans. Uh, they represent millions of Germans. So, you know, I think there is part of this, this way, it, it is growing, um, and there is things People can do here. Uh, there's, there's, we, we're taking there's um, some activists here at, outside. Uh, you can sign up to the mailing list, and there's actions happening all the time around the country. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, protests outside embassies. 
uh, protests outside the DOJ. There was a huge protest outside the DOJ on the 8th of October with, you know, great speakers from across the spectrum, you know, ex-military uh, journalists, human rights activists. So it really is a growing movement. And I suggest, yeah, you take some of the flyers, take some newspapers, and sign up to the list to find out what's going on and get involved. Thank you. Um, you, you, you sit right behind me. Yeah, go ahead. So what's the point of fighting a tradition? I mean, Brits not going to go anywhere, right? They just want to uh, just leave England. So, well, I mean, you can stay in Belmont forever, right? Technically speaking. Yeah, I, gu I guess, you know, the what we've seen and what the expert witnesses uh, testimony has found and why the extradition was originally rejected at the magistrate's level uh, was the expert testimony said that Julian would likely die if he was extradited here. You know, we saw uh, there were elements within the national security apparatus that actually want Julian dead. Uh, so that's the sort of situation that Julian faces if he's extradited. Right, but if he's not, this is a system up. Well, if he is not, he uh, is in a prison, in a maximum security prison, but we still have a fighting chance. So we are still fighting to stop the extradition. I think hope is very important in this situation. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, are American news organizations doing enough, in your view, to help some? And what, would, what do you say to the sort of still lingering accusations that he is a puppet of the Russian regime of Putin? Um, I would say there's pro look, the editorial boards of the major parties who uh, publish the information for which Julian is now being prosecuted. Um, you know, they've, they've shown their support. Um, I think in showing solidarity with all journalists who are imprisoned around the world, uh, you know, publications can always do more. I think probably the diminishing power of the media um, and, and other powers taking advantage of that becomes more difficult for them. Um, but, you know, this is a fight where they could probably centre their focus and show solidarity with, with Julian because once this falls, I mean, this whole country is built on the idea of the First Amendment. You know, the whole reason we can have these festivals and the reason we can have these discussions is because freedom of speech is, is held up above everything else here. Um, and this battle says that what Julian's been charged with is receiving, possessing and publishing classified information. Now, publications do that all the time in the US. But that is a crime. That is a crime. And so they can choose to use that whenever they like. They haven't been able to yet, but if they do, there's a precedent set. And so I think, you know, focusing the idea that this needs to be protected is really important in this country and around the world because it sends a message as well. And so I think organisations, other media organisations, can do more, can always do more. But it's a critical time that uh, that's recognised as well. Yeah, just on, I mean, this Russian puppet stuff is just complete bullshit, to be honest. Um, and it's a distraction, it's a total distraction. Yeah. You know, it's to distract people from the actual principles, the actual principles that are at stake in this case. Uh, like Niels Nelson said in the film, you know, Julian turned the spotlight uh, on the Bush administration. Uh, the, the crimes of, a, of, a, of the Iraq war, an illegal war that was, um, you know, the, the WMD lie that everybody was told. Julian exposed all of that, exposed, you know, the war in Afghanistan and how that was being run. And they decided to, instead of, you know, turn the spotlight on him. And, and that is part of that. Those sort of bullshit smears and, and things like that, that, that's part of that... Uh, that work to um, you know dehumanize Julian and turn him into something something else and and make us forget you know what's really at stake here you know it's our right to know our right to know uh, what our government's doing now. I'll just say one more thing on that point because I want to thank Joe Laurie because he reminded me of a, an article that was uh, leaked uh, from the uh, Pentagon it was a kind of a, a cyber security assessment on how to handle WikiLeaks. Two thousand and eight was published. It's a thirty two page document. And basically, it was tactics to try and assess how they were going to respond to the rise of WikiLeaks and the information that was being published and able to get out to the public. And one of the solutions was legal prosecution, obviously, which Obama decided not to because otherwise then all the other publications, all the other media outlets uh, would have had to follow suit and they would have had to be prosecuted as well. 
But the other idea in there was an unrelenting campaign of reputational destruction upon WikiLeaks, upon Julian, and upon anyone who associated with him. So think about that. If you had that written about you by the Pentagon, we need to do to undertake an unrelenting campaign against your reputation. So what does that say about their tactics? This is 2008 this was written. The, you know, the, the budget of the Pentagon, they could, they could shift 300 people aside to work on that for the next 20 years, you know, or the rest of Julian's life, and we would never know. It's those sort of publications how we understand how power works. And I think it's, I think it's really important to understand that when we think about uh, those accusations as well. Okay, we just have time for one more question, so I'm going to go with you right there. Yeah. Can you talk about uh, the origin story of this documentary? What, when you guys decided to make it, how you decided to make it, and if it was ever about another element, did that evolve, or was it always the same story? Yeah, well, it was back in, uh, so it was in 2019 when Julian was, uh, had just been taken into uh, Belmarsh Maximum Security. Uh, he was, I went to see him with, with John and, and journalist John Pilger, and he was, I'd never seen him like that before, you know, throughout all the years he'd been in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, under house arrest, uh, I'd, I'd never seen him uh, in a state like that. He was being kept in the, in the health wing of the prison, uh, which the prison is actually called the hell wing, and kept in his, you know, uh, solitary confinement essentially. Uh, and I left the prison that day thinking uh, that I might not see Julian again and, and that's when uh, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a film producer, I usually produce uh, scripted drama films, uh, so that's when we started to think about, uh, you know, making a film, uh, making a film about the Julian that we know, uh, about, uh, you know, this gentle genius, um, you know, this family man, uh, who loves his children and loves his family, and and how do we do that? And and at the time, you know, because Julian's in prison, so you know, how did we get to know Julian? And so at the time, John was traveling around, um, traveling around Europe, advocating for Julian. So it seemed obvious to start start following John. And when we did that for about six months or so, and then then Stella, who had been Julian's secret family. Uh, her name was about to be revealed in some court documents, and she uh, decided to take control of that, and, and that's that first interview we see in the film with um, that BBC journalist. And, and so we started following her as well and tracking her and following that journey. And so, yeah, it, it, it evolved over time. You know, it's real life, it's not a script. So, uh, yeah, we, we started following um, Stella and John, and uh, that sort of you know, became a dual, uh, a dual sort of protagonist story. Uh, we can shout out to Niels Lardefoek here, who was our uh, amazing cinematographer, who was captured all those brilliant moments, um, all those uh, very personal moments um, that you saw, you saw in the film. Um, but yeah, we shot and we shot, and, and it wasn't until Ben, uh, Ben Lawrence, one day I called Ben, and we, we started chatting about the film, and we're on the same page, you know, from the very beginning. And and, and it's really when, uh, you know, Ben came on board as the director and, and uh, did all those amazing interviews that you see with John, the sort of thre uh, the thread of the film, and really took control of the story um, and made it what it is with our editor, Karen Johnson. And Gabriel, thank you so much for sharing the film with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, if you thank, I don't get an opportunity to thank people, but there's, Neil's acted like a co-director, really. I haven't had a chance to thank him like that, but really, uh, he's, a, he's a Danish journalist and filmmaker, and, and we really made it all together. It was a wonderful team. Uh, to all the supporters here, I know there's some people in the audience who uh, help financially within the film. I want to thank Randy Credico, who is a national treasure, who should already be. Uh, and, you know, anyone who's kind of helped us along the way. So I think Alexandra Nikolchev is here, who she, she filmed some of the New York sequence as well. Uh, and anyone else who I forgot. So thank you all for coming tonight. I'm, I just noticed that, that um, there's a QR code thing on your way out. There's an um, audience award for this uh, festival. So please vote. I think you can give us five stars. 
um, <laughs> that would be the best. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and please put your email down. If you do one thing uh, today, just put your email down. It's on your way out, um, and you can get uh, updates uh, of what's going on around the place. Thanks. Thank you. Guys.